Good morning and welcome everyone to today's webinar on the new code for construction product information industry consultation, better data, safer building. As some of you might already know, my name is Fabiola and I work as an events and membership executive for the CTA. Today, I will be helping our host, Adam Turk, Chair of um, CPA Marketing Integrity Group, Peter, K Peter Kablehorn, CPA Chief Executive, and Amanda Long, Chief Executive of the Considerate Construction, Construction Scheme. For the first 35-40 minutes, Adam will lead the discussion on the new code for construction product information and the consultation which has recently launched. He will pass on to be there to give some context on the new code and Amanda will join during the Q&A to comment on the setup of Construction Product Information Limited. As an independent, not-for-profit not organization responsible for administering and managing the forthcoming code for construction product information. The last 20-25 minutes will be dedicated to answering your questions, so please feel free to type your queries in the Q&A box. And at the end of the presentation, I will be reading them out to Adam. If we run out of time, any leftover question will be addressed privately afterwards. Before turning the floor over to Adam Turk, I want to remind you all that the webinar will be recorded and the chat will be active for comments. We hope to post the recording on the CPA website within the next 48 hours. Thank you, Adam, you can feel free to begin. Hi, good morning, everybody. Let me firstly start by doing the, uh, the share screen and that should be bringing up, hopefully, uh, my slide. Fabi, will you nod if I've got that right? That's perfect. Thank perfect. you. Perfect. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Fabi, thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined. I can see we've got well over 200 participants, which um, shows the level of interest in the new code. So really delighted that everyone's given up some time this morning to join us. Um, just want to say thank you, um, not just to Fabi, who set up the webinar, but to Matt, who's been working behind the scenes uh, on all the marketing activity, uh, to the team, the Marketing Integrity Group, and the Technical Subcommittee, who've been working uh, with us through this program and um, also particular thanks to Amanda who'll be joining us shortly from the Considerate Constructors Scheme for her input uh, and finally to Lucia and the team at MRA who've done an outstanding job in a very short space of time uh, to get the consultation out there and, uh, and pull it all together. Um, a lot of you on the call I hope will know me for those of you that don't. Um, I'm the uh, Chief Executive for SideRise um, I've been in the construction products industry for around 30 years, and I've worked around a number of different product sectors uh, and market sectors. Um, when we talk about what we're going to talk about today, on reflection, there's a small group of us that have lived and breathed this for over two years. And for us, it's something that we've become very passionate about, um, and it, it really lives and breathes for us. Um, and I guess... The real objective for me of this, this hour that we have together is to try and encourage the passing of that baton to the rest of the industry so that everybody sees how important this code is and really picks up that passion uh, for themselves. So I'm going to try and bring the code to life a little bit. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the background, uh, how we got here. I I'm going to assume that most of you have read the code, but I'm still going to delve into it and give you it maybe a little bit of paraphrasing, a little bit of different view. And then we'll talk about the consultation itself and then kind of uh, 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 what, what, comes, what comes next. Um, I will highlight some key areas, and I particularly am looking for your support with the consultation and the code itself. So talking about the background, kind of put some context, really. I just want to remind ourselves how we got to this, um, this point. Um, obviously, we had the Grenfell Tower fire now three and a half years ago. And that prompted uh, Dame Judith Hackett to pull together the report, Building a Safer Future. And amongst other things, because it particularly challenged competence in the industry as well, it challenged the clarity of construction product information. And reading between the lines, and a lot of you have heard me say this before, I think what's really being said is that everybody, if everybody who worked on the refurbishment of the Grenfell Tower um, building had known everything that they should have known about the products they were using, they probably wouldn't have used what they did. And that's our responsibility to make that information uh, more readily available, clearer. So this clarity of construction product information was the challenge that was laid down. And as I say, alongside that, 
also a challenge around competence in the industry generally. This kind of yin and yang, there's no point providing amazing information if the people that are using it aren't competent to use it. And equally, there's no point having really highly qualified, competent people if the information they're being given isn't clear. So I think that applies uh, throughout. So in November of that year, some six months later, we formed the Marketing Integrity Group. And I was very honored when Peter asked me uh, to lead this, lead this work. And the key uh, piece of work that we did that really got us going was the call for evidence that took place in spring of 2019. I think, you know, and I highlight this a lot, and I've spoken about this a lot. It took around half an hour to complete the survey. And if you took the time, because there were a lot of free text opportunities that were voluntary, um, it would take a lot, lot longer. And yet, um, the 524 people who completed the survey between them, when all of their free text answers were put together, managed to complete 181 pages of free text information for us. And that information was so valuable because you would see literally 30 people saying the same thing off their own back about a subject area. And that really gave us some, some good, good meaty information to take the work forward. So then we spent most of the last 18 months developing the code uh, with a number of marketing and technical professionals from within the industry that have been involved. And so that brings us to where we are today, the industry consultation that's just launched this week. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to get the code live sometime in June, and that by the end of this year, we'll be able to see manufacturers starting to be granted registrations, having been approved through the assessment process, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Peter, I know that you're on the call as well. I don't know if there's anything you want to add just to this background. Good morning, uh, Adam, and good morning, everybody. And thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, a great introduction to this session. I just wanted to add a, a few points from me, if I may. Firstly, of course, um, in turn, I've got to thank you, Adam, for the way that you've led the group and the, the energy. And of course, there's an awful lot of time been put into this uh, by you and the Marketing Integrity Group, uh, and we're in, in immensely grateful for, for all that, that hard effort. Um, and it can be seen in the document that we have put out for consultation and hopefully in the plans we've got going forward. You've, you've very succinctly um, identified why, why we have done this and where we've got to at this particular point. But I think it is incredibly fortuitous that, that we are at this point with the code when, in parallel, the government have just launched the product, they just announced the, the launch of the product regulator and the OPSS uh, and how that will, will work. And, in fact, this morning I've just come off of my first call with the team to discuss exactly um, how they will be developing their part of, of, of that uh, push to ensure that the, the sector um, it generates a, a better relationship with, with um, how it produces buildings that are safe um, and how we can in turn work with the code and with the process that we see going forward. So this is, this is an amazingly optimistic moment in time. Um, I'm, I'm immensely hopeful that we are going to achieve something that will really revolutionize this part of the industry and also do its part in terms of all the other bits and pieces that are coming together uh, in the name of building safety. And I think it, it's crucial in terms of, of how we all recognise this. I'm, I'm very pleased that, that Adam mentioned that, that to try and uh, get the outreach to everybody that we need. Uh, but it, it's also important to say that, you know, this is part of an overall process. Uh, it's about ensuring that the whole construction industry goes through a culture change. Dame Judith was very keen to emphasise um, since the launch of her review that industry should not wait. And I've assured her several times that we have not been waiting, we've been preparing, we've been working hard. Uh, and today I think this is really good evidence of, of what we've been able to do. So I think I should stop there. Adam, thank you very much and hand back to you. No, thanks, Peter. What drives the passion? What's our why? Where did we start from? Um, I think wherever we are in the industry, it is not unreasonable for us to expect that the people using our product information are confident that they can rely upon it as being good to use, accurate, up-to-date, clear, etc. And 
this is the absolute why of what we're trying to 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 do which sits in the center of everything that drives this work is this absolute principle that whether you're designing a building whether you're installing something whether you're maintaining something you have to be able to rely on the information given to you by the manufacturer and that clearly hasn't always been the case and for us the integrity the integrity of our industry is going to be demonstrated by how we respond and how everybody now gets behind the work that's that's been done so the Code for Construction Product Information is 11 clauses, and this is aimed at creating a consistent, robust approach. Some of you will have heard me use the term level playing field. I think historically, you know, as manufacturers, without necessarily a rule book per se, we play the game of top trumps. We'll go to customers and we'll put forward those things that are really great about our products, and we'll try not to talk to them about some of the other things that actually they really need to know as well. So this is about creating that consistent, robust approach to how product information is communicated. And I do want to say at this point that this is about how product information is communicated. This is not about how you test or anything like that. It's about if you say something about a product, it's about how you communicate that. So let's start with some definitions, because I think we need to, to really get our heads around what we're talking about. Um, and again, I'm going to paraphrase from what's in the report. I just want to pull some things out. Product information is about everything that you give internally or externally about your product. So this is not just about that brochure or that technical data sheet. This is not just about your website. This is about a presentation. This is about a demonstration. This is about um, something that you put in an email. If you give information about a construction product, then that's taken in account of in the code. Equally importantly, let's just talk about what we mean by a construction product. Um, a product, a substance, or a collection, and the collection can involve a system. So there's been a lot of work about systems. If you supply a product that somebody else puts in a system, then your responsibility is about the information about the product. But if you say, in this system, because of our product, this will happen, now you've taken ownership of information about the system, and therefore the system becomes the product. Um, and in some cases, you will be uh, pulling together the whole system yourselves, and therefore you have uh, full full responsibility for that. This is about whether it's for temporary or permanent inclusion in a building or civil engineering works. So civils is included, and clearly it's new construction, it's refurbishment, it's maintenance. Okay, so this is a very wide brief. And I know when we started this work, people said oh, it's all about fire. It's not all about fire. There are so many things where we provide information about products that impact the safety of the building, that impact the way the building is used, that impact the efficiency of the building. So this is everything to do with construction products. And lastly, the manufacturer. Now, we've used what was the old EU kind of blue book definition. Um, if you are a company that has a product made for you in another country by another manufacturer somewhere else, but you bring that product in and you market that product under your name and your brand, then you become responsible as the manufacturer for that product. If you're a merchant and you have own label product, that own label product going to the market is yours. You become the manufacturer in the definition of a manufacturer. If you um, take a ready-made product and you repackage re it, um, and put it under the market in your own name. You become the manufacturer. You become responsible for it. So it's really, really important to understand that this is not just your traditional big uh, big manufacturers. There's a lot of other people within the industry that become responsible um, as the manufacturer for the information that's going forward. Crucially, when we went through um, the work of the survey and we did a number of focus groups and we did lots of uh, individual meetings and we started to really engage the debate, what came through very clearly is that there are five acid tests that construction product information must meet in order for the supply chain to be able to rely upon it. And that is these five acid tests. The information has to be clear. It has to be obvious when you're reading it. As a competent person, what you're reading, you can understand. It must be accurate, truthful, you know, straightforward. It must be up to date. A lot of issues around uh, version control and things being out of date. Accessibility is really important. And we talk about um, one of the things that came up as a real challenge is the challenge of substitution. Now, we don't directly address substitution in the report. What we're doing is we're talking about the information. So 
Um, again, one of my kind of favorite sayings is we design at leisure um, and we procure in a rush or a panic sometimes. You know, we spend months designing and specifying buildings. And yet sometimes it's four o'clock in the afternoon when we get a phone call for material that's needed on site the next day. And, oh, crikey, the blue one's not available in stock. We'll take the red. I'm sure it's the same. Um, and what we find is really important is not that substitution is wrong, because it isn't wrong. Over time, the development of a building, things change, materials change, new manufacturers come in, different products come out. Sometimes there are issues, genuine issues around commercial reasoning. But what's really important is to ensure that the product you're substituting to has the same or a better performance standards in the areas that are specified as the product that you're substituting from. And to do that, you have to be able to get hold of the information. So it has to be accessible. We saw lots of examples in the survey and people we spoke to said, we just didn't bother because we couldn't get the information quickly enough. We thought it was okay. We assumed. Um, so this is all about making sure that information is readily available and clear. And lastly, it's that it's not ambiguous, that we're not putting forward statements about products that are, uh, uh, that are ambiguous in some way. And so the 11 clauses aim to address all five of these acid tests, and we've split those clauses into four categories. So the first category is around information creation. Um, and really straightforward things I don't think anyone will, will appreciate having a, a challenge with. Um, the sign-off process is important because lots of technical people we met said, well, you know, marketing and putting stuff out there and they, they haven't quite got the wording right or they've put forward something that's that's maybe not, not put forward the product in the right way. So we felt it was really important that there should be a sign-off process and that somebody senior and technical within the organization signs off the product information. The version control is important so that people can tell at any time whether or not they have the latest version or that potentially an earlier version was used to specify and they need to bring that up to up to the latest version. Um, and this whole principle around information creation about being clear about the wording you're using, plain English, um, not to use this misleading or ambiguous wording. You can't say that something is soundproof. You have to say that it, it performs acoustically and reduces the sound by so many dB and you have to give that information and that background to be clear. Don't be ambiguous in the wording. The second area is the real meat of the code. Um, and this is about the core performance and product data information. And what we're effectively saying is if you're going to make a claim about your product, then you have to back it up. You have to be able to, to be really clear. If you say that we have a classification or certification, you've got to show that. If you say that you have put forward uh, performance claims because you've calculated something in some way, then you've got to be able to verify that. Um, and characteristics and descriptive uh, matters about the product have to be readily available, easy to access. We want our customers to be able to get hold of the information in an easy way and to know that what they're reading is correct and true. Lastly, Really importantly, we're marketeers, sales, commercial people, largely, I think, technical people on this call. And occasionally, the factory might decide to do something slightly different over time. And when they do so as a business, you've got to know that that's happening and you've got to be able to update your product information. If you put different things in the mix, if you change the way the product's made, then the product information is no longer consistent with the product supplied. That's really important. It's really important. We tested this product. This is a certification that that is what you supply. To not do that is effectively to cheat. Um, and so it is really, really important that the, the product information is consistent with the product supplied. Some associated information, really important. We miss all this, don't we? We, we don't talk about what happens after we, the stuff leaves our factory sometimes. We talk all about the performance of the product and how great it is, but we don't give clear information about handling, you know, and sometimes that allows products to deteriorate in their quality because they're not handled in the right way and therefore when they're installed, they don't perform to the, the correct uh, performance. Um, we don't necessarily talk enough about maintenance and there's a lot around end-of-use disposal of the product. All of that information is as important as the product performance itself, and all of that information has to be available. With regards to specifically to guarantees and warranties, um, we are asking that we should be clear about what it is that's covered, what it is that's excluded, and what it is that's required to meet the conditions of the guarantee or warranty. So again, just being clear up front, and being able to get that information early. And lastly, the last two pieces of the code Again, partly related back to the substitution issue, make sure that people can get help easily, that they're not scrabbling around to try and find somebody. Get the contact details, 
uh, for your technical helpline uh, available so that people can make that call so that if there's anything they're not sure about from the information they can they can back that up but lastly and really really importantly and this is about we've got to make sure that the people within our organization are competent for the role that they are performing and i arc back to i had this conversation with a, a friend a few days ago 30 odd years ago i did a stint in the life insurance industry and there was something called loutro came out and basically you had to be trained to be able to sell the products and so they would train you on one scheme you say, great can i now sell this as well no 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 you've not passed the training for that and it was two or three weeks training exams and until you'd passed those particular tests you weren't allowed to talk to anybody about those products we don't do that we bring people in we put them on the phone they're talking to customers they're giving information uh, we give people uh, price lists and car keys and send them out to see customers we don't necessarily train them to be competent to answer the questions the customer's asking it's really important that the people we employ are competent to the level of knowledge required for their role and that they know the limitations of where they have to say, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I need to refer that to a colleague. Really important. So this was the, the little bit of competence that overlaps with the work of the competence working group, which didn't address competence within manufacturers themselves. So we felt that was important to include in, in our work. Okay, so that's a little bit about the code itself. As I say, there's lots more information in the report. Um, but I just wanted to bring that to life a little bit and, and, and just bring that through. The most important thing is that we need you to have your say. The industry consultation is open. It will be open for eight weeks. Um, and it's, it's a 20-minute survey. Um, there's some examples of some of the questions there on the right. Um, but what are the objectives? What is it that we're trying to achieve? So I think... Firstly, we want to understand from the manufacturers how easy or difficult, how long this is going to take you to be able to be ready to, uh, to uptake the code. Now, this is not so straightforward, and we accept and we appreciate that. There's nothing that we've talked about that anybody would argue isn't sensible for a manufacturer to be able to do. But the bigger you are, the more complex your product sets and ranges, the more work that's got to be done. Now, I I'm very proud to have the role I have at Siderise. Um, our chief executive, Tony, Tony James, stepped down after 29 years leading the business uh, recently. And his mantra was that everything in the company was done properly. We're renowned as being the best at what we do because of the way in which we portray our information, the technical information we've got, that everything is done properly. And yet I can assure you our company is working very, very hard. And I've known about this for obviously a long time to get to grips with all the things that are required in the code. And we are still three or four months away from being able to say that we completely comply. And that's okay. It's work in progress. But there is work to be done, and we want to understand from, from you guys how much work is involved, how long it might take. We also want to understand um, if there's anything we've missed, if there's anything that's not clear. We want to understand any areas of concern. We're interested in understanding if certain parts of the code are more complex for you to meet the requirements of than others. There might be some that you would say uh, straight away, we already comply in these areas. These areas are going to take us a bit of time. This area is going to take us a long time um, because we've got to consider how we phase in the verification assessment processes. So it's really, really important that you get scripts with this. The other thing is we want to raise awareness. Obviously, we've spoken a little bit about the code, but we've not really been out there. And now we are out there. And this is about awareness. I'm really um, thankful to MRA for the work that they're doing with social media, uh, getting the press involved um, to raise awareness for the work that we're doing. The last thing I just want to say on the consultation, and please take this the right way, um, this consultation is not to challenge whether or not we do this. We're going to do this because as an industry, it's time for us to stand up and be counted. And it's time for us to make it clear that we are really proud of what we do. We do have integrity in most of the businesses in our industry, and we won't be shamed by those that have made the mistakes that have, have publicly come out in recent times. And so we will do this and we will do it quickly and we will do it right. We want you to input to make sure that we're doing it properly and we've covered all of the different areas that we need to. Um, but please don't come back and say we shouldn't be doing this because we're going to do it. So the implementation um, of the code, and this is quite important because I think along the way with the people we spoke to, there was a lot of comments about um, we don't want to see industry marking its own homework. 
we don't want to see the manufacturers saying we'll do this and we'll check it and it's going to be okay. Um, we want to see independence in what we do. And we spent a lot of time talking to people, different organizations, um, and researching a lot of stuff that was done. A really fascinating meeting, actually, with the Advertising Standards Association to understand how they work. That's one that will stick with me for many years. Um, but where we've ended up with, and I'm absolutely delighted, is to be working with the Considerate Constructors Scheme. Now, the Considerate Constructor Scheme got a new CEO a couple of years ago, and Amanda's done amazing things with the organization, and the respect for that organization has grown immensely during that period, and they really are uh, getting out there and making a difference, um, and they have the infrastructure, and they have the respect in the industry to do this. So, Considerate Constructor Scheme have formed a new company called the Construction Product Information Limited, CPIL, as we'll affectionately call it from here on in. Uh, we tried to get CPI Limited, but weren't able to register that name. So CPIL will run and manage the code for construction product information. And the back office support will be supported by the Considerate Constructor Scheme infrastructure, which is established and is there. So what does this give us? First of all, it gives us complete independence. And let me assure you, and you'll hear from Amanda shortly, she's joining us around now, uh, and Amanda will answer some questions, hopefully. Um, Amanda is a force to be reckoned with, and you know she will stand strong for what she believes in. This is a very independent organization. It's not for profit. So the fees that are charged are only to cover the costs of running the scheme. They have established infrastructure. They are very advanced in the use of AI technology to assess without people running around the country. They, they've got their act together and they understand how to do this. Um, as I say, they're respected. They're particularly respected by government, by stakeholders, but they're respected by industry and senior people within the industry. And more recently, they were uh, successful in winning the bid to run the Building a Safer Future Charter, which some of you on this call will have already signed up for. I know we have a side rise because it's the right thing to do. Uh, we want to build safer. Um, but they are responsible for that now as well. And so this all ties together. Considerate constructors, building a safer future, good data with the construction product information code. Moreover, they will establish an independent governance board with an independent chairman who potentially may come from outside the industry to oversee the code. Um, and I'm hopeful of having a place on the board to ensure that manufacturers are properly represented, but it will be an independent board. So we're still working through some of the detail for how it will work. And the consultation is really important for that because that's where we need your input and feedback. Um, something like the company would register and there'll be some initial online stuff to do. And a lot of that will be around cultural. We want to see that the company are really behind supporting this work. Then there'll be a request for information, which will be submitted digitally, which will then be verified. And then lastly, there'll be a direct liaison with an assessor uh, who will challenge test in the same way that you might go through a BSI audit. There is a um, suggestion that there will be some ongoing of audit of information. We've looked at uh, some systems. There was one we looked at the other day, which will, as you put something new on your website, will automatically know that and will check it. So you say, we've just got RAS accreditation for this product set. It will cross-reference in an AI form with the RAS website to check that that's true. Um, specific ex events would require assessment. So perhaps you launch a new website or perhaps you'll launch a whole new product set. At that point, CPIL would expect you to let them know and they would want to assess that, that information. And then we'll have an annual renewal process and that'll be a much more straightforward way of working. The complaints process that we're talking about, actually similar to the way that the Advertising Standards Authority work, kind of a three-tier complaints process. Now, if they find something that's not right, that may be because they've come across it through one of their ad hoc uh, work or through somebody making a whistleblowing activity the first step will be to put an arm around the manufacturer and say we've we've understood something that's not right can you fix it please and we would expect the manufacturers to put the hand up if they realize they've made a mistake and get that corrected as soon as possible if though that kind of activity doesn't work then there'll be a suspension from the code which will be marked on the website um, and further action taken, and eventually a company could find themselves uh, kicked out of the code, um, which would be, again, demonstrated on the, the code website, and potentially the matter handed over to trading standards if it's felt that it is uh, 
in breach of what should be done properly. So we've got a process coming together and that, uh, that should be reasonably straightforward to, to manage. Another dimension, and thanks to Peter for this really smart suggestion quite late on in our work, the idea that maybe, as well as having uh, obviously manufacturers assessed and verified against the code and becoming code compliant, that we should create a category called supporters, that where an organization is able to demonstrate their support for the code uh, by working with code compliant manufacturers ahead of those that are not, there could be some kind of supporter verification, um, which may help a contractor in work with their client because they're able to demonstrate that they're working with good levels of information. And again, there's some questions on this in the consultation. We're after your, your view on this. We're determined to leave at least 20 minutes for questions. So I'm just going to come to an end now. Um, for me, the call to actions are really straightforward. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're a provider of information or a user of information. Your view is really important, and we really want to get that as quick as we can. Um, the call to action is to firstly download, read, and digest the report if you haven't already. It's a reasonably straightforward read. You can answer the consultation as an individual or as a company. So perhaps you may want to discuss with colleagues. You can, you can print the uh, questionnaire off. So on the site, you can actually go in and print the questions. You can discuss it with colleagues. Um, you can prepare your answers and then come back and complete the online consultation as a company, or you can do it as an individual. Don't wait. Don't wait for us to come back in a few months' time and say, right, we're ready. Here's the code and go, right, okay, what do we need to do? Start doing it now. It's clear. It's clear what needs to happen. Um, start getting your organization um, fit for the new code and to become code compliant. Um, what I can tell you from the work that we're doing ourselves, it will help to make your company run better. Um, it's the right thing to do. It feels good to do it. Everybody embraces it in the organization. Um, and you know we're going to start as soon as we can to help make the buildings that we build safer. Um, so watch this space for the formal launch. Um, be ready to apply to become code compliant when it is launched. Be an early adopter. Don't wait for, for everybody else to, uh, to get involved. Um, and yeah, have your say. The consultation's open till, till the end of March. Um, and I just, that's sort of my finish and we're on to the Q&A. Um, there is one question that came up really early, which if I can, if I can answer that now, because I think that's really important. Christy from Recipol has asked us whether, um, how this if impacts distributors and merchants. And it's a really important question. It is covered in the code. And we did discuss this with the, the Builders Merchants Federation, and we, we've had a number of conversations. And where we feel we are is this. And again, please comment on it in the consultation. Um, if as a manufacturer, you pay to have your information reproduced somewhere else. So say, for example, you subscribe to MBS Source. Um, and I will promote them slightly because they did help us by running the uh, code call for evidence originally and did a great job. So thank you to them for that. But if you pay for that and supply your information, you're responsible. You're responsible for making sure it's, it's accurate and up to date and for updating it at all times. If you work with somebody downstream, so a merchant who supplies your products, then what we are saying is if you as a manufacturer are code compliant, then you must have an agreement with the merchant for the way in which your information is presented. And there are two things. Firstly, that you have to take ownership to make sure that the information presented to them is correct and that they will give you the opportunity to sign off on that information before they publish it. And then lastly, that there is an agreement between you to update information to ensure that it's always up to date um, version controlled, etc. And on that basis, where the merchant then reproduces your information, they can then use your CCPI registration. The CCPI logo will appear similar to, say, a BBA logo. You'll be given a logo which has a number in it, and that number will apply to your business and your products. And therefore, that logo with those numbers can be reproduced on the page with your information. So it may be that a merchant or distributor will have a book with a number of products in. Some of those pages will have the, the CCPI logo for the manufacturer, and some of them won't. And in that case, that's fine. That's okay. And it will show the people using that information which, which 
information is in there that is code compliant that they can rely upon and where they're taking a chance. I hope, uh, I hope Christy, that answers your question. Um, there's also a question from Paul Surin about have we included the Chartered Institute of Marketing in discussions? I say absolutely we have. We've been talking to SimSig and they've been very supportive um, and potentially they're going to get involved with some of the work around the code as well. So yes, we have, have done that. Um, Fabi, do you want to pick out some other questions? There's some hands raised as well. Yes, of course. Um, so we just have a comment from David, uh, which is basically asking for uh, if you're open to collaboration. Um, then we have a question from uh, James Ellis. Peter talked about a culture change within the industry. Do you envisage that construction product will switch from a price to deliver to quality to deliver focus? Well, I guess that's that's definitely for me, Adam. Um, actually, the the answer the answer to that is yes, but it, it actually is a is a move for the whole construction industry. And if we look at the work that's going on right across the board, uh, procurement, contract, competence, uh, there is there is a general mood towards um, delivering delivering value and delivering quality. And I think it's an, an essential move that the industry has to undertake. Some of you may have, have seen the government playbook, uh, and you may also have seen the, the value toolkit that the co that the um, hub has, has recently launched. Both of those uh, are moving the emphasis towards delivering for quality and value. And I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Bider. Um, from James, James Jeffcott, um, Section 4 of New Clause, an industry-approved recognized standard, most of our certifications are either a BBA certification which aligns with compliance or European standard. Would that be sufficient under the new scheme? Yeah, so a BBA certification is a third party certification, and that absolutely is right. But what happens is you would say you would put your BBA certificate logo on your information, and uh, you would be asked to have the certificate available for you know for for confirmation. So hopefully that answers the the, the question. Um, Thank you, Adam. I think I've answered James Jeffcott's question on the the, the merchant as well. Um, where would you like to go next, Fabi? I can see some of the questions on the, um, on the screen. I can see one from Mike Wharton, uh, which is asking to please define what you mean for confidence accreditation certification and who is um, going to provide the training. Peter, do you want to pick that one up? Um, yeah, by all means. Um, so there are a number of number of acknowledged def definitions for, for all of those terms. Um, and in fact, actually, we, we are stretching into the territory of the um, setting the bar um, report, where I, I think all of those uh, are are clearly identified and defined. That basically, some of them are quite complicated um, concepts. But I think what we will do as we move uh, the whole scheme forward um, is make clear where we've centred our definition for each of those. But of course, it will be based upon um, in industry norms for each of them. There's there's a question in here from somebody anonymous. Um, thank you, Peter. Sorry, I, um, about the competitive nature of the information. I can I just say at this point, um, and this has been quite a difficult one for me. Our industry is hugely profitable, and that's a really good thing because profit is not a dirty word. And that allows our industry to invest in R&D, in new products, in new facilities, in better automation, in our people. And it's important. And we've got a good history of doing that. And that's why we have a good industry. Um, and what we're not suddenly going to do is become an Amazon shop window with uh, price cost comparisons where uh, we suddenly end up reducing to, 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 in that way, the competition to, to, to pull the rug from the the, this kind of the, the, the established foundations of our business but we do need to make the information about our products clear and accessible so it has been about finding the right the right way of doing that and i know this question about um ip is is there um, and is a concern is that there has to be sufficient information given to back up your claim without necessarily giving away 
the uh, intricate IP around the product. Mm. Mm. Um, and Adam, if I may just jump in there, I think that's a crucial point in, in that, you know, I think for decades we are all used to information being included in procurement documents, in specification documents, um, and I don't think anybody is expecting uh, any more than that. But what we are expecting is that the quality of that information and the trustworthiness of that information is absolutely on point. Yeah, no, I agree. Amanda, you've joined us and welcome. Uh, good to see you. And it's great timing. So a great question for you just to start you off. Um, we've had, uh, and it's an anonymous person who's put forward a question, who validates that CPIL are fit and proper to provide registration to the code? Are they UCAS or similar accredited? Thanks thanks very much, Adam. And uh, I wanted to pick that one up. And also, there's another question that Stuart Norris had put forward about resourcing to handle every manufacturer at the same time coming into this. I could uh, talk about them both. Um, the Considerate Constructor Scheme, which has come in to support this process and develop the uh, indep independent verification uh, and assessment system that, that will be put um, uh, behind this and, and set up uh, the CPIL, um, has done a similar thing in the last year for the Building a Safer Future Charter. Um, and in that case, once we had set up the the uh, the framework and the system that we work to um we have then been in discussions with UCAS who have come on board and endorsed what the building a safer future charter is doing and we will take the same approach to to um uh, uh, to the CPIL and uh, and and hopefully be able to to have uh, UCAS also supporting our work there that that will be uh, the same uh, approach that that we will take in that case. In relation to the question of resourcing this, um, as you can imagine, uh, there, there there will be. Um, over time, a, a substantial volume of verifications and assessments that will need to be run. Um, what we're what we're planning to do um, with that in the first instance is following the consultation. Um, there will be a period of time, which uh, I'm sure Adam talked about in his presentation, where there'll be there'll be time yes. for organisations to start getting themselves organised. And during that time, we will have a process open for organisations to start registering and saying that um, uh, they want to be part of uh, the verification process. Um, and at that point, we will start a sort of a queuing uh, system so that we can start to work out what numbers of verifications are coming in in the first instance and how we handle getting them to uh, to volume so um so if we had to open up to every manufacturer on day one uh, that would certainly be difficult but what we're actually doing is is a is a process over a period of time so that we can work out who's coming in in the first instance to to adopt this and make sure that we've got the volume to be able to manage the verifications and the assessments uh, that need to be done. A large part of the process um, it will be a self assessment and um, and verification process online, which will uh, be based on an enhanced um, a machine learning enhanced tool, uh, and that will help us deal with the volumes uh, that that we have in the first instance. Thanks, Amanda. There's one I just want to touch on actually, because this is really um, kind of. Ex ex a good example of why we need your help in the consultation and uh, Andy Williamson's um, made a couple of comments and I know we spoke on the phone the other day and he's absolutely bang on so he's asked about in clause nine where we talk about guarantees and warranties um, we also talk about durability and he feels the same requirements should be in place on durability statements e.g what's covered what's excluded and the requirements and do you know what you're spot on Andy and we've missed that and and that's really really important so you might say that uh, our product has a 25-year life. And again, it's quite right. The manufacturer has to put forward on what basis that is. Um, and there will be what's covered, what's excluded, what the requirements are in order to have that life. So these are the things that we would ask you, please, get into the consultation document so that we can get all of this information back out. That's really, really important. Um, you also asked, Andy, um, should we be looking to introduce an expiry date on certificates to help the industry understand when a certificate becomes outdated? That's quite an interesting consideration, I guess, because certificates do have a life, don't they, typically? Is that right, Peter? Mm -hmm. Very much, very much, Adam. Uh, and I think that's something we need to, we need to look at uh, very, very 
closely because, you know, part of the whole concept of information being trustworthy is, is that it's up to date. Um, the, the, the corollary to that is to give it um, a date where it needs to be reviewed or and updated. So that's certainly something we need to consider. Okay. Quick one. Uh, Rupert, you've asked if the report, is the report summarising the evidence gathered available? It is. It's on the Building Safely website. You can download the report from the Call for Evidence that, uh, that was issued about 18 months ago. And there's some good data in there that, uh, that hopefully you'll find uh, useful. And Neil Gibbons, you've asked about, will the process help the tracking of products and therefore recalls if needed? We start talking about DOI and stuff like that, piece. So I don't know if that's worth just touching on. Uh, I, by all means, Adam. Yeah, I, and Neil, thank you for that. Um, yeah, uh, coming on behind this, of course, are the are the uh, are the programs that we're developing for digitalization of the whole sector, uh, and and we see this very much as as a series of initiatives that that, that will help the whole industry. Um, so obviously, we need product information digitalized. Obviously, we need um, we need clear digital recognition of each product, um, and those and those programs are in major development now, and will support uh, everything as we go forward. And this year is likely to be a really exciting time for this whole sector uh, because I think there's, there's there's clear ambition to get all these out there into the marketplace and help. Yeah, and I, you know, it's also about direction of travel. We've talked about recognizing that our industry is very fragmented. It's full of a lot of SMEs, and that we wanted to set the standard for the the code at a level we felt all organisations could get into straight away. There was a lot of talk about a number of the digital things. I mean, when we start talking about DOI to to really get this traceability, that that's too much to ask some of the smaller firms to get on board with early. So. We've set the bar at a place we think is appropriate, and we envisage over the next two, three, four years for that bar to continuously raise in terms of the level of compliance required. So, um, there, you know, this is a direction of travel piece as, uh, as well. So, I think that's uh, that, that's quite important. Um, Adam, uh, yes. One second. I just saw that Jane raised her hand, so I'm going to try to let her. Please. Go. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Put a question in. Uh, question and answers really just for for uh, those listening um as you said uh, adam the origins of the code lie in safety issues um but environmental impact of construction products especially through environmental product declarations um epds is increasingly gaining recognition amongst clients designers and procurers um they don't necessarily understand them yet but they are <laughs> knowing they're important um, and you said early on in this webinar that the code applies to all product information. Um, yeah. And can you just clarify that you're also thinking about environmental impact as yeah. well, given the origins? I think it's important for people to be aware of that. Yeah, no, we absolutely are, Jane. I, look, I think that the, the key ones that come out initially are fire, acoustic, thermal, public health, um, sort of strength um, and environmental. They're the things where companies make big claims about products. And so they're the focuses, but it absolutely applies to everything you say about product. We want to give confidence to the people using the products that whatever information they're taking about that product in order to help them use it, it could be size, it could be weight, it could be packaging. If they're given that information, it has to be clear, accurate, up to date, accessible and unambiguous and that's just to help people do their job properly so it absolutely implies the environmental and you know particularly people we get we talk about unambiguous terms people say my product's green you know i've got you know energy efficient what it that's that's an ambiguous term you have to put down what it actually means you know in terms of what 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 it is why is it green it uses 20 percent less carbon or it you know it, they have to be able to to document that so a hundred percent environmental uh, things will be part of this there are so many questions coming through that I can see I was really uh, uh, like to pick out. But, but Fabi, do you want to, to, to take your pick? Um, well, I can see that Ken raised his hand as well, so I will allow him to talk. Hello. Hi. Hiya. Hi. The, uh, the, I don't know how I got the screenshot up of number 10 because I'm not at number 10, by the way. Uh, Adam, uh, I'm great. Good to speak to you again. I'm just interested um, particularly that the... You right, rightly say this is not just about fire. 
uh, and nor was Grenfell just about fire, of course. But I think you've just clarified, nevertheless, there are fire products in the built environment that do have an absolute need to be in this zone. Uh, I'm thinking of, um, uh, uh, of obviously, um, fire doors, um, fire suppression systems, uh, fire stopping. I just wanted your uh, the conversation to ensure that you're having that discussion, not necessarily with me, although you'll know that I'm involved in this area, but hmm. particularly people like the Fire Industry Association. Yeah, we. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done with a lot of associations, and there's lots of calls going into the diary to talk to people. Um, and we we really are going to rely heavily on the associations because so for example we talk about what's an ambiguous statement so we're looking for the trade associations to be the the owners and the police of that because the trade association should understand what are the correct terminologies for their sector of the industry um we're looking for the trade associations to um pull focus groups together to get their members to work in the spirit of the code in the areas that are particular for the terminology used in in their world. Um, and so the trade associations have a massive part to play in this. If if anything, if I when we did the call for evidence, the trade associations were a little bit lukewarm. There were half a dozen to a dozen that really got behind the call for evidence. So you saw, for example, um, that we got lots of responses from architects because we had real good support from the architects world. We didn't get so much support from one or two other, other areas. So we really need the trade associations to pick this up. And they should be there to support their members um, and to help, to help work through this. Um, ultimately... If Amanda's organisation is not is has a dispute, they will probably refer back to the trade association for particular specific input. I would have thought, Amanda. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, absolutely. At the end of the day, we we will have to go to where there is expertise on this. Um, there are a couple of other questions that that sort of relate across to this. Um, there's one question that was just raising that what they can see here. It's a very positive comment, but what they're saying is um, what they can see is. Uh, compliance and policing will be the challenge. Um, compliance and, compl and policing are always the challenge uh, for any of these codes. It's absolutely the case. And um, what what we will do is, to some extent, um, there will be there will be some peer policing, and of course, then there needs to be some uh, adjudication where there's disputes. There, there is a uh, a question later that also raises in respects of complaints. How do you envisage dealing with complaints where there are different interpretations of regulations that are dealt with? So, in terms of compliance policing and disputes. We're going to set up a portal that enables the reporting of complaints and issues so that we can we can pick those up. Um, I mean, right now at CCS, we, we, we have a, a similar system and we we, we deal with with some 500 complaints coming in and out, out a month that that need to be individually investigated and, and are so. Um, where we have a particularly problematic complaint that there isn't a clear answer to, such as the different interpretation of regulations that, that is risen by one of the anonymous comments, um, we we envisage that we will have to, as as Adam quite rightly says, go back to the trade associations and, and engage with them to be able to understand uh, the sort of the expert view of that, and we will we will have to put together basically uh, an expert panel that will support some of those decisions when you've got a particularly diff difficult um, uh, matter that, that needs mm. to be considered to when as inevitably comes with these systems. Uh, but they tend to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, but ultimately, the policing um, comes from uh, peer, peer input, peer, peer, uh, peer whistleblowing, uh, peer concerns being raised. Um, and, and then we will have to fall back on uh, different ways of engaging with the expertise that the industry has to offer to be able to inform the decisions that are made there. But do so in a way um, that they are that they are separated from the incident or the issue so that independence can be informed by expert advice but not inappropriately influenced in any way. Could I just could I just jump in and just say that that um, additionally to all of that we are of course uh, opening up discussions with the um, product regulator and the the OPSS uh, and clearly um, early days yet but they're very interested in how the code will operate but of course 
their remit and their approach is is very much coming from the the regulatory position but there is clearly a definite interface between how they will see the marketplace and product safety and how we are hoping that industry will will address um, issues for themselves thanks peter can i there's one thing really important there's so many questions i apologize if we don't get to all of them there's nearly 100 questions so far but somebody has said why a code was a published standard considered during the consensus process? Could the code become a standard in the future? It's a really great question. Thank you so much, because we talked about this a lot. So first of all, if we went for a standard, it would take a lot, lot longer, years, and we didn't feel that we had years. Secondly, once we enter the standard, we're into a very, very rigid framework, and we feel that this needs time to develop um, and really fill out. Um, and we talked before about raising the bar and, the way it's going to be managed and run. So we felt this was a three-stage process. It starts as a code, it moves into a PAS, and then eventually it should become a standard. I do agree, but I think that's years off. I think we want the industry to embrace it and really get their arms around it, and we want to really flesh it out with the support of the trade associations to get it working uh, really, really, really well. Um, Thank you, Adam. Um, sorry, our time is up. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get back to all the questions. Um, if you have any, thank you, first of all, for joining the webinar, and I hope this was useful. Um, if you have any further comments or uh, questions or, on webinars or CPA membership, please uh, email me. Um, finally, the recording of the webinar and the PowerPoint will be, will be available over the next 48 hours on the CPA website and on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a nice rest of the day. Yeah. Adam, Amanda, and Peter. Thanks, Fabi. Well done for, for managing it so well. And everyone, go, go fill in the consultation. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.